Ho, 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 ho. Welcome, everybody. AZ Cooks Instagram Live. We are celebrating the Italian feast of the seven fishes as well as the eighth night of Hanukkah. And we couldn't be more blasphemous by doing a dish with what I'm assuming is a very unkosher ingredient in squid uh, <laughs> on the eighth night of Hanukkah. But what can you say? I mean, culture overlap, we gotta do what we gotta do. I am Andrew Zimmern, welcome to AZ Cooks. A huge, huge uh, Hanukkah hug to everybody who celebrates. And as we transition in to the rest of the December and January holidays, one of my favorites is the tradition of doing the Feast of the Seven Fishes, which most people tend to do on Christmas Eve, but I wanted to do a very quick and easy dish because these days, with COVID going on and we're not able to acquire as many ingredients and stuff, I have a lot of friends who are doing the Feast of the Two Fishes or the Feast of the Three Fishes or maybe just the Feast of the One Fishes. But this is gonna be a salad and a technique that you're going to be able to use every day for the rest of your life. You are going to love this salad because everybody loves calamari. Uh, before we get to that and we make a lot of smoke in the walk and we answer your questions and I'm in a festive and feisty mood, my friends, so you better be bringing it tonight. Let us light our shamas because it is the eighth night of Hanukkah, so we have to do this. Asher kitchana be mitzvah tav vitzivano lahadlek ner shel Hanukkah. And I don't want any letters. I am writing, I am lighting these from my right to left, not your right to left. This has been the most powerful and spiritual Hanukkah season of all of my years on planet Earth for one very simple reason. Uh, because we're in the age of COVID, because hundreds of thousands of Americans have died because um, of some of the horrific conditions that we're going to be enduring here over the next six or seven weeks. The story of faith and persistence and the deliverance from a problem has been very, very resonant with me. So I think that's kind of cool. And I'm, I'm like a New York City Jew. I'm, I'm not, which is a version of Reform Judaism, just like New York Times, good, Russ and Daughters, good, Temple, uh, you know, I go on the high holy days when other people insist that I do, or I'm trying to impress my kid. But this has been a really, really powerful Hanukkah season for me. So there you have it, a little insight into my personal life. So many people love the Italian tradition of cooking the Feast of the Seven Fishes. And the idea is to come up with seven different fish dishes that you can serve over the course of an evening, drink a lot of wine, hang out with all of your friends, everybody. It's a late into the night type of eating affair because people tend to make too much food. And you know, the seafood risotto and grilled fish and a fish in a salt crust and a fish soup and a fish salad. And you, everyone goes kind of nuts with the fish thing. And I realized I'm gonna be doing that this year. And I realized, you know, why am I doing, why am I busting my balls? to do seven dishes when it, it's probably just gonna be like me and my kid, right? So here's what I decided. We're gonna do like the Feast of the Two Fishes. We'll have like two seafood courses, right? And everybody loves calamari and this is one of my favorite salads to do. It is very familiar to any Italian, Vietnamese, Thai, Cambodian, uh, Laotian, or anybody from Southeast Asia would uh, recognize these flavors, but they are distinctly Italian. And isn't it amazing the way food travels around the world that a dish blindfolded, I could serve this to an Italian and they would say, yes, this is very, very Italian. And somebody in Asia, Southeast Asia would say, yes, this is very, pick your country, Vietnamese. Uh, and the reason is the dressing. So let's make that first. We we'll let our wok heat up. I have some honey here. Traditional sweetener of ancient Italy, right? There was no refined sugar. Lemon juice. A couple of tablespoons. We'll adjust for that later. A nice glug of olive oil. And then the magic secret salty ingredient. Uh, which is colatura delici, which is the Italian version of fish sauce. Now, the Vietnamese 
fish sauce masters don't have the stranglehold on this ingredient. The Italians take a very specific anchovy. The Nettuno company, the only company in Italy that hand harvests the anchovies in season and using ancient stones and ancient um, pots actually distills and ferments and makes this incredible colatura. And I was there in the Bizarre Foods Amalfi Coast where I went all up and down the Amalfi Coast. The final scene was in this tiny little shop with these cute little old ladies making the colatura and making me pasta with parsley and a little bit of colatura that was just absolutely out of control. It is just a very elegant, syrupy fish sauce. And it's absolutely out of control. And if you like anchovies, if you like that fermented fish flavor, you wanna put a little bit in something, take your cue from the ancient Italians who did it with garum and the Vietnamese, the Thais, the, the Burmese back in the day, the Laotians, and mix it with a sweetener and some citrus and whisk it and then taste it and you will find a dressing that is not fishy at all. It's not too sweet because you're gonna add more lemon juice if you like and this dressing, oh my God, on a steak salad, out of control. Delicious. No, you can use this on anything. It's a wonderful sauce. You can use it on grilled fish and dip into it. I just need a little more. Oh, almost perfect. I had the right balance with everything and I, I had one lemon out for a reason, right? It's gonna need that entire lemon. So there we have it, our dressing. We're gonna set that aside. Uh, next thing that we want to do is we want to cut our squid. So on the recipe, I mentioned the fact that we like to take our squid and the morning that you're going to make it, you know, defrost it the night before if it's sold frozen. If you have access to fresh squid and most people who live in the coastal states do. Um, by the way, the squid, the animal looks like this, right? This is... There's the squid swimming along. Um, you remove the pen, which is a very thin uh, plastic looking bone. Um, the, the head, the ink sac is already out because they don't want you to have the head because they do other things with that. And the ink sacs uh, fetch a huge amount of money uh, on the squid ink market. Uh, so that comes out and you're left with these two pieces, but it's frozen. And sometimes squid has uh, water added to it. And uh, this one did not, it's a very, very clean product. But I like people to leave it on a tray, on paper toweling, six, seven, eight hours in the fridge, let it dry. Because that way when you throw it in the wok, you don't wind up with squid soup, right? With the tentacle sets, I just cut them in half, right? That's all. Just cut them in half. Yes, you're gonna get the long legs. There's two long legs on a squid. One and two, right? That do most of the propelling and the steering. Uh, that's okay if one set goes on to uh, one set of legs. You don't have to evenly divide it. And then the bodies of the squid, I want you to cut, you know, what is that, about a third of an inch? It's going to shrink a little when it hits the pan. But if you notice when I'm cutting it, there's no water pouring out of it. And that's the key. If you see water coming out of your squid when you cut it, what I'd like you to do is put it on, back on a tray with some paper toweling, put it back in the fridge, blot it, even if it's just for 20, 30 minutes. Let the water come out of it and onto the paper toweling in the fridge, not in the pan, because the secret to this salad, because we're gonna put cucumbers and tomatoes and radishes and chilies and onion and carrot and lots of fresh mint and that wonderful honey lemon anchovy dressing. The whole beautiful part of this salad, the predominant flavor is none of those things. 
the predominant flavor is the scorch of the saute pan. Now, some people use a cast iron skillet, get it wicked hot. I mean, as they say in Boston, wicked pissa hot. Uh, I like to use a wok because my wok gets really wicked pissa hot, right? So I'm gonna turn this up to 11. That's a spinal tap reference. I am just now going to season Get some crusty black pepper in there. Can you add any other spices other than? Uh, you can, but I'd rather you taste the mint in the salad, right? That's the whole point. And I am going to add just a little bit of vegetable oil or peanut oil, grapeseed oil, whatever it is that you would like and then slide it off the plate. Now, why is that important to slide it off the plate? Because if you use your hands, you have to drop it. You might get spatter on your hands. You slide it off your plate, you protect your hands. And I'm actually gonna move some of these squid tentacles onto the side of my wok. And why am I doing that? Because the wok is just a giant flat piece of carbon steel that's curved. So it's gonna cook, I may not even have to move any of this. Where did you get that wok? Uh, this is a uh, joist Chen or an Allen Ho. It's someone's walk from like Target. Um, Kenji uh, Lopez Alt, who is one of my favorite food people on planet Earth. Someone asked him about the walks he was using for his next book. And he's like, oh, I have one that I bought at the local Asian market and then another one that I got at Target. And it's like, yeah, you just need a carbon steel walk where, wherever you want it. The, I leave this here. I don't have one of these at home because I sometimes, the handles uh, here are a, a plastic that's heat resistant, but I like old school woks that are all metal. Anyway, once you get to the point where you've got a little bit of sear on that, all we're going to do is give that a little shake. The one thing you don't want is to overcook your squid, I'm gonna to have to re-season my wok. Um, but the beautiful part of this, when I tilt, there's no liquid, right? It's nice and dry. And I can smell that scorched, I mean, there's not enough fat in squid for you to get those real serious sort of like burn marks on it that we associate with, but the, the smell of that, well, here's, Here's a ring. Can you see that? It's actually scorched around the edge. That's what you want to see on some of those pieces, right? So I'm just going to let that cool because I don't want it to wilt my mint and stuff like that. So I'm going to mix everything in a bowl. Oh, by the way, while that's cooling, I forgot to thank our sponsors, the wonderful folks at Helados Mexico, the good people at Florida Cana Rum, and our friends at Shun Knives. I hope all of you have entered the competition to win some Andrew Zimmern uh, Badia spices. That was a horrible burn I just gave myself on the first night of Hanukkah candle, right there on the end. Um, we have uh, two knives, a different winner for each one, a seven inch and an eight inch, beautiful razor sharp blonde wood handles. I mean, this is some fantastic uh, knife product, and you're gonna get some Andrew Zimmern spices that are sold at Walmart, at ShopRite, but, uh, and at BadiaSpices.com. Uh, but these are ones that are coming, we're sending them ones from our personal stash, aren't we? we are. So these are, this is like, you know, the first edition of it, you know, the better one. Um, what is the texture of the squid like? Uh, well, when you fly it through a warm kitchen, the way we just did, 
uh, very tender, and it is it kind of is like uh, I don't know, got a chicken breast sort of texture to it. Um, if you overcook squid, squid are like clams. So there are two things you can do. You can either cook the crap out of them and they get tender, or you fly them through a warm kitchen. So like 90 seconds in the wok at that nice, uh, a nice ring like this. Mm. You don't even need teeth. Very, very mild flavored as well. How do I avoid to overcook them? Don't cook them so long. They're asking, how do you avoid the squid from coming out tough and chewy? Uh, don't cook them in the, the middle time space. <laughs> so here's the thing with squid. You can eat it raw, right? You gotta be careful, we got fresh squid. But you, you just wanna barely cook it, or you wanna cook it for an hour, like stuff it and braise it. A lot of great dishes for stuffing and braising it where it cooks for a long time to cook the stuff that it's stuffed with and it's meltingly tender, right? So it's one or the other. Kind of like clams. You can eat them raw or barely cooked. But if you kind of just pop, steam them till they open, they're kind of rubbery. But if you put them in chowder and cook them for a long time, they're really tender. Does that make sense? I hope so. It makes sense to me. Makes sense. Um, I'm going to add some tomatoes. I'm gonna add some of my sliced cucumber. Now, I like to keep this Italian and have a Calabrian chili. We didn't have any of those. So I am doing a uh, red Serrano uh, chili and I've split it in half, but holding onto it at the stem end. And we're just gonna cut some thin slices. Is that a watermelon radish? That is a watermelon radish, as well as a conventional red radish. I love watermelon radishes. They are beautiful. Um, some chilies, because we want some heat to that. Um, then we have this beautiful cluster. But if I have mint in the garden, I have all those wonderful little tips of mint. Um, I will... Uh, just use those little tips. Otherwise, I just roll some of these big leaves and their stems together and cut a very rustic chiffonade. I am not trying to pretend that um, I'm doing something super fancy and delicate. I just want a lot of mint flavor in there. So we're gonna cut that into a ribbon that's about, I don't know, a eighth or sixteenth of an inch thick. I'm even going to put some of those stems in there. Can you use a different herb? Um, well, you can, but the, the, what makes this salad so craveable um, is the mint with that honey and lemon dressing and the seafood. That, that is an incredible combination and is very, very common in Southeast Asian countries and in Italy. Um, I have this onion here. I'm gonna trim the ends. I'm gonna sharpen my knife. Someone just bought your Tuscan Sun seasoning and said it's amazing. It is amazing. You know, the Tuscan Sun is fantastic because instead of using fake garlic and shallots and onions, we have dehydrated garlic, shallot, and onion in there. But the best thing about the Tuscan Sun, we have dehydrated red wine powder in there. So even if you just sprinkle a little bit on a salad, you get that tannic red wine flavor with the oregano, with the basil, with the chili peppers, with the uh, garlic and onions and shit. It's unbelievable. Anyway, uh, keep your knives sharp. want too much onion. I don't want onion to be the dominating flavor here. So I like to scatter it and see what I look like. Yeah, a little more. Any ideas of good herbs to grow inside in the winter? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> it depends. If you have a good grow system, uh, like your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend used to be a weed dealer 
and they left all this stuff in the bathroom and you can grow a lot of it. I mean, you know, those little pots, I don't bother. I, I'd rather just buy what I need because, you know, I live in Minnesota. So if I go away for a couple days and it's cold, everything tends to die. So I'm not much of a little herb pot guy, um, but I will tell you um, at my house, when you walk up the door, obviously not now because it's 10 below zero or whatever it is, uh, but to the right and left are these uh, areas where we have, I don't know, 10 square feet of mint every year. And the idea being when I went to Morocco for the first time and you turn a corner on a street and just like mint, I mean, it was like walking into a, a mint factory. Mint was piled high because they drink mint tea all the time. There's a lot of mint in the food, but it's really the mint tea drives the market there. Um, I was blown away by the smell. So if you plant a ton of mint outside your front door, when people come into your house, they smell all that mint. And it's my favorite thing in the whole world. And at the end of the year, I pull up all the plants. I use those uh, pants hangers that have the clips and I bundle like this much mint together, wrap a string around it and hang two of them off each hanger. And two, three days inside, it's dry and I bag it up and then I have mint tea all winter long, which is, I think really fun and cool. Um, okay, uh, you can cut the carrot by hand. A lot of people like using these slicers and that's okay. Sometimes I use them too, especially if you're looking for a perfect slice or you're just looking for a shortcut. But let me tell you what the trick is. If I look at my fingers, I cut myself. If you look at where the carrot and the blade come together, you'll never cut yourself. Okay, and I know that sounds counterintuitive, counterintuitive. But if I look at the carrot and the blade, by the time I get near there to the bottom, I know to just stop. Because this is not a Rolls Royce. This is the last inch of a carrot. Eat it. Don't risk cutting the tips of your fingers off. Now, sometimes I blanch the carrots when I have guests coming over. Just dip them in a sieve into, put them in a sieve, dip it in boiling water, count to 30, pull them out, rinse them in cold water. You get a brighter orange color and they're a little bit soft, tender, crunchy, chewy. I do not want to damage my vegetables with a lot of juice from the squid while I'm tossing them. It tends to dirty up the salad. Mm. This is so healthy for you. By the way, you don't even need the squid with this delicious salad all by itself. If you need to slide apart some cut cucumbers or some cut radishes, by all means do that. What's going to help is when you put the dressing on. Because the dressing with the oil and the other liquids in there will help everything slide around so your stuff will stay separate. Do you have to use the dressing the day you make it? Hmm? Do you have to use the dressing right away when no. you make it? The dressing, the dressing will last for 24 hours in your fridge. It's still good two days later. It's just a little flatter. You know, the citrus flavor is flatter. Um, but if you have leftover salad dressings, what I would insist that you do is use them to marinate chicken and pork chops and all that other kind of stuff. Because all I want to do now, that the warm squid, it's not hot squid anymore, it's warm squid. Can you recap the dressing quickly? Yes, the dressing has colatura in it, which is an Italian anchovy-based fish sauce. Very sim similar to nuoc nam. And lemon, honey, and olive oil. And then... All I want to do to serve this, I don't want it in a bowl because I want everyone to see some very smart person 
called out the watermelon radish. And I want, we have those yellow and red tomatoes. We have the watermelon radish. I mean, look how beautiful this is for a winter's night. Serve this alongside a big grilled piece of fish. As part of your feast of the two fishes or go nuts and do all seven. If you happen to have enough people in your house, I just sprinkle a little bit of salt, finishing salt on top. We have salt in the dressing. I seasoned the squid when it went into the pan. So why not do that? And before your guests, and by the way, the dressing is kind of, uh, I only have a very big fork, which can mean only one thing. Someone took all the forks from the dishwasher and put them all into our little catering station up here. We'll blame Madeline. We're gonna blame Sean. <laughs> Sean's not here, right? We always blame, or JP. You gotta blame someone who's not here. Um, anyway, uh, this is just such a fantastic salad. Could you use a different sea seafood besides squid? Oh gosh, yeah. you can use shrimp on this. You can do anything that you want. The reason that I chose squid is that I don't wanna fry squid in my house for the Feast of the Seven Fishes. And I'm usually using shrimp in something else, usually something cold and poached or in a risotto or a pasta. And so where am I gonna put my squid? I usually put my squid in a salad. Hopefully my mother is not watching. That is so fucking good. Oh my gosh. It's just, it's bright and vegetal. And that charred squid just goes so beautifully with it. But that dressing, now with all those other ingredients and with the lemon juice, the honey, but most importantly, the antiseptic brilliance of the mint cuts through that mild anchovy. This, the colatura is, it's not like a little tin of canned anchovies where you're biting into it and you're like, oh, that's so fishy. It's so elegant and clean. Oh my gosh. Mmm. Wow. Okay. Um, that's the dish. Recipe is on the website. Oh, we have lots of time for questions. Um, The importer of Netuno Colatura is a company in New York City called Gustiamo. And I'm pretty sure they're gustiamo.com. Pretty sure. I think we st we'll, we'll stick it in the, uh, when we post, we'll make sure that we have a link to them. Anyway, Gustiamo, uh, I order from them all the time. This is not a plug. I have no, no relationship with them. Um, but I order from them every month because that's where I get all my tomatoes. It's where I get all my pastas. It's where I get all of my botarga. It's where I get my capers because they have the right, uh, they import the best of the best. I hate anything other than fresh artichokes, except the brands that they bring in that are packed with lemon and olive oil and herbs that are so insanely good. Uh, their colatura is from Natuno, the best. Their pastas, the best. Their tomatoes, and every month they have tomatoes from a different region in Italy, wherever it's been harvested and can just right. So if you're into like tiny little Sicilian cherry tomatoes, super sweet, like sugar, because you like a sweeter sauce, they have that. If you like something with a lot more acidity, like a side of Mount Vesuvius Roma tomato, they have that, right? So. Please, nice, go buy your Italian goods from Gustiamo. And it comes right to your door. So you don't have to go out and shop. So you can stay healthy and not get COVID. All right, Vicky, what do we got? How many but years? read that question slowly so I can have one more bite. How many years do you get out of a shoe knife? Mm. I have, um, it's not here, it's probably in the back. <coughs> oh, that chili. 
Ugh. <coughs> they got me, Mom. Um, wow. I have a shun knife that's, I, I don't know, 20 years old? As old as when I first got turned on to the company? You just have to take care of your knives. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I have been, I have knives, I'm not 100, but I mean, I collect knives. So I have some knives that are really, really old. Um, you know, if you win this knife in the uh, competition, well, yeah, actually it would be this exact knife or this exact knife. Um, if you win one of these two knives and you take care of it, it will last you a lifetime. You give it to your children and they'll give it to their children. They'll give it several lifetimes. I have a should knife. Let me see if I can find, yeah. I have this one. This is the oldest one that I have, right? They call it a classic boning fillet knife. But there's nothing really classic about it. It's just such a gorgeous shape. Anyway, my version of it is missing this whole piece. Because over the years, sharpening it, sharpening it, sharpening it, sharpening it. And I have it at home and I use it like a little paring knife now. And I'm not alone because I've seen this knife whittled down from sharpening in other cook's kits. When this knife first came out, everyone got it. I mean, that is a beautiful... Is that a beautiful knife or what? It is beautiful. And you will use it for everything. It is superb. I butcher lamb with this. Uh, I can use it as a slicer because it's curved. I can use it as a parry knife. I can choke up on it. Uh, it's wonderful. So, yeah. And I'm not saying that because they're our sponsor. I'm saying that because it's a great knife. Um, Matt Jennings. A wants to know if you've tried braiding your beard yet, but also wants You mean to like know Captain Lou Albano style with little rubber bands? Yeah. Yes, no, I have not. Matt Jennings used to have a beard that literally hung down to his schmeckle. Um, that's belt buckle, Vicky, in Yiddish. Come on. Uh, and he would braid it and do all kinds of things, and we would sit in movie theaters while I ate popcorn. I'd just play with it when we were dating. And then, <laughs> then he met his wife, and two of them are very happy in Vermont. They have kids. Do you make seafood boils? Oh, I love seafood boils. And as a matter of fact, um, the minute I start thinking about friends back on the East Coast, and I know this is crazy, uh, Matt Jennings and I have been longtime supporters of some of the same events in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, where his old restaurant Townsman was. And uh, <laughs> there's a fantastic chef uh, from that part of the world, Tiffany Faison. And Tiffany, at this one event every year, always makes uh, a, sh a shrimp boil with potatoes and corn and onions. And uh, I think she uses linguiça sausage, a Portuguese sausage in there. Um, and I love her boil so much. And I, and I literally, she puts out this like huge pot of it and everyone just comes by and grabs it or she'll serve up a little bit. And I will walk by and I'll just kind of sit there and just eat till I'm tired. I mean, way past being full. Uh, it's kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, I love seafood boils. Here in the Midwest, we have a whitefish boil. And no shit, this is what happens. You go to a fire department in Wisconsin and they will do it as a fundraiser. And they have a stock pot this big and this high and they put it on a giant outdoor turkey fryer burner, right? And they, they fill it up with all the vegetables and all the other kind of stuff and everything in there. And they get it boiling. They put all the fish in, right? Um, and they cut the fish small, but it takes so long that, for that to come back to a boil. So you know what they do? They take like two cups of gasoline. And they put her, pour it on top and they drop a match on it. And the whole thing explodes. It it bubbles up. The heat flash is so insane, right? This is a true story. We, we, did, we saw this in Bizarre Foods in our Wisconsin episode. And uh, it boils so hard, it actually pours out over the top. But because gas and water don't mix, all the gas winds up on that isn't burnt off and all that flavor winds up. You can't tell that it ever had gasoline poured on top of it. It's just to get it to boil fast again and it makes it so hot all the little cubes of fish cook. I, I kid you 
not. Look, Google it, you will see that. And that's like, you know, booyah kind of stuff. Not Stuart Scott's booyah, but the Midwestern boiled uh, fish and fowl and potato and corn communal meal. Booyah. What's your favorite way to prepare venison? Uh, grilled, medium rare. Luxury cut. Uh, the, my friend Asher, uh, I did not get uh, to go out and deer hunt this year. And I had several friends give me wild Minnesota venison because I love it. And I got a rack, a uh, beautiful rack from my friends at D'Artagnan. They sent me one. Uh, I just, I adore venison. Any kind of hoofed animal wild, I prefer to beef. And uh, my friend Asher gave me uh, a big piece of top round with a little bit of other muscle attached from the leg. And he gave me a tenderloin. And the tenderloin I charred rare in the fireplace and sliced it and ate it with crispy potatoes. I put that on my Instagram. And the one that got eaten too fast was uh, I made a braised dish. I sliced the leg really thin, browned it, hit it with a bunch of onions, uh, some paprika, kind of like a stroganoff, right? A lot of sauteed mushrooms, some thyme and rosemary, uh, some uh, sherry in there, and then some stock, and just let it simmer for like 20, 30 minutes. And it was, oh, out of control, served it over buttered noodles. I love a good stroganoff. Oh, and finished it with a little bit of creme fraiche. Yum. What was the inspiration behind the name French Kiss from your seasoning? Okay, next question. I want bank pain. There's HR, the, we all work together. So I can't, I can't really, I can't really say, but the idea is that you should be, um, if you're lucky, enjoying a French kiss under a Moroccan moon. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Okay. We want bang, pam. Is there anything better than the first time you kiss someone at the beginning of a relationship before everything goes sideways, <laughs> which could be the second date, but is there anything better than that first date and that first kiss? And the reason we named it that was that this was the first spice blend that we sort of developed. And I just love it so much. And I love tarragon and I overuse tarragon. But this, this is literally like putting France in your fingertips to sprinkle. Uh, but I had to call it French kiss. Had to. Someone wants the bank pan chocolate espresso molasses cookies, like the banging pan ones that you Oh, uh, okay, so Sarah Kiefer, who is the inventor of the pan banging technique, uh, which vaulted her into like Instagram fame and everyone had to have her on their TV show and, you know, an amazing book. She has, God, why, her, her website is called Vanilla Bean Blog? Mm, I mean, I just clicked, to it. Uh, anyway, uh, I saw those sugar cookies there and uh, that was it. And the pan banging technique, for those that don't know, is if the cookie's going to cook for 16 minutes, she says, put it in for eight, open it up, lift it four inches, bang it. And it ripples, it creates these ridges. And then every two minutes you lift it up and bang it and it just creates this flat rippled surface, but it makes the bottom crusty and keeps the top chewity. And it's just, she does it for chocolate chip cookies, for sugar cookies, for everything, and all the recipes. She also, is her cookie book is either just out or about to come out? I think it just came out. I think it just came out for the holiday season. Uh, but Sarah Kiefer is a, um, a cookie genius. Um, and she is one of the many, I am, I, I consider myself to have a fairly decent uh, skill set when it comes to uh, cooking savory foods, but I cannot cook. Well, that's not true. There's eight or nine desserts that I have perfected and I've just stuck there. I mean, I've just stuck there. I'll put my tarte de tin up against anyone's certain custards, a, a simple ice cream base, a good pie, right? But there are people who devote their lives to the baking arts and I am nowhere. I can't, I'm not even in their league. I'm not fit to carry their knife case, right? Um, so why do I want to experiment with my own recipes when I can just find a really good Sarah Kiefer cookie or a really good Zoe Francois cake, right? Or 
something like that. So that's the deal. Uh, Matt Jennings' wife, uh, Kate, easily the best cook in that family. And that's saying a lot because Matt is one of the best culinarians in the country. But the seat, the, I'm, and he will be the first one to tell you, his wife, one of the best, one of the best cooks in America. And an amazing, I mean, the, we can call her a pastry chef, I think. Well, I think Kate would prefer to be called a baker, um, but she is remarkable. What's the best sauce to pair with octopus or pasture? Octopus? Octopus, yeah. anything. Olive oil, and if you need to, a little bit of lemon and some cracked black pepper. And that's it. By the way, this is a true story. Because every time I think of grilled octopus, I think of my friend Jose Andres. So uh, we're friends in real life. So, you know, we're out, we're having dinner, which happens a lot. At least, well, when, as much as we can with someone who's running around the world saving uh, our planet, thank you, thank you, Jose Andres. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm his friend, so we go out to dinner and, you know, the, he, the server comes over. Everyone's looking at their menus. His, his daughters, his wife, our friend, whoever, you know, it's eight, ten of us there. Everyone starts ordering. Jose goes last. He pulls the waiter aside and he says, look, don't bring any of that. Bring us a whole bunch of shellfish, some oil, raw, simple, nothing on it. Then I want you to take these. You've got like duck, you've got steak, you've got chick. Just grill it hot on a planche. He says, and then just olive oil, salt, and lemon. That's it. That's it. And just bring all that out. And you figure out the side dishes. And everyone who's just ordered is kind of sitting there looking. But Jose's right. That's the best way to eat anything is just with some salt and some olive oil. And if needs a little lemon or something, go ahead and do it. Simple, basic, naked cookery, which coming from a guy who, some of whose food is as complex as anything on planet Earth, uh, is pretty darn funny. By the way, did anyone see uh, Ann Coulter uh, said, saw him on TV and said the nastiest thing about him, uh, called him a something foreigner. I mean, it was, it was bad. A it was, nut. yes, a nutty foreigner. And Jose was so funny. He said, you know, I'm a nut. I'm hard on the outside and I'm delicious and tender and I'm nutrient dense and that's why we need a food czar. And uh, he was very polite and funny. I could not resist tweeting. It pissed me off so much because if someone says something nasty, you can't say something nasty back on Twitter. You have to make sure your friends are like, okay, I got this, you know, because what do I care? I probably should care more. God, that pissed me off, though. Ann Coulter. I mean, you know, the idea is that Jose was talking about is we need a food czar. Biden needs a food czar. Jose would make a great one. Tom Colicchio would make a great one. There's lots of food people that really understand what we need to eliminate hunger and take care of a lot of other food problems in this country. And I, uh, some of us have been saying this for four or five years. Jose's been saying it for four or five years. I've been saying it. We, well, we've both been saying it since before the Trump election. Uh, I was hoping that in uh, Obama's second administration after, uh, because remember the first lady, uh, Michelle Obama, uh, had her whole Let's Move campaign and the Healthy Food campaign. And Sam Cass, the White House chef, got elevated to a food czar position. But then after he left, they, no one really stepped in there on the food czar side. And I really think we could have expanded sort of where Sam, who's brilliant, left off. Sam Cass would make a great food czar. Favorite thing about your test kitchen? Two dishwashing machines. Nice wine cabinet. Mmm. Plate warmer. Plate warmer. The, uh, we have this amazing test kitchen. We have a big prep kitchen in there and storage facilities and a cool kitchen that, by the way, we're redoing this in February. Um, and there's a big space over there. We can do a seated dinner for 24 people. Well, we could during pre-COVID. Um, and we've done cocktail parties, fundraisers for people for 140. Um, so yeah, it's fun.
I love you guys. Everyone have a great and safe weekend and we will see you next Tuesday, the 22nd. We're no Thursday is Christmas Eve, so we're not going to be doing Thursday. We're going to be doing Tuesday the 22nd with a special holiday edition of Instagram Live where I will be making a deconstructed beef wellington that's a lot easier to make than the Gordon Ramsay version, let me tell you. Love you guys. You did say Passover eighth night.